To whoever this may impact, sometimes our lives have to be completely shaken up, changed, and rearranged to relocate is where we're really meant to be. Sometimes change feels like loss, transformation is scary, and sometimes to discover the best version of ourselves, we must let go of absolutely everything holding us down. Welcome to I Missed Me, your new safe space. I Missed Me's purpose is to help people all around the world to come back home to themselves. It is a healing self-growth podcast that encourages people to dive deep into their emotions, heal their traumas, and ultimately love themselves. My name is Mafia Sures, I am your host, and I hope to be a part of your healing journey. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Irene Dunn and David Niven in The Sisters. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our play tonight, The Sisters, takes us back to a time when there were only 45 stars in the American flag. Flimsy airplanes and flickering motion pictures were the wonders of the age. Theodore Roosevelt was president of the United States, and Jim Jeffries was heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And, and laryngitis made you just as hoarse then as it does now. It was the day of hayrides, quilting bees, and torchlight parades, when the automobile was a horseless carriage, and nice young ladies either got married or taught school. Whichever they did, they seemed to age more rapidly than our more enlightened ladies of today. For today, women know more about ways and means of staying attractive, such as using our own Lux toilet soap, which helps to keep the modern woman young in appearance and young in heart. But even though the action of the sisters takes place in the days before youth became an art, it's a very modern play. There are still artful dodgers of responsibility who remain plumed knights in the eyes of the girls who love them. And for such men, girls still sacrifice security and all that they've been brought up to, as Louise Elliott does for Frank Medlin in tonight's drama. The idea of co-starring Irene Dunn and David Niven was mine, but the choice of the play was theirs. Ordinarily, we schedule a play and then select the right stars. But this week, we had the stars, so we let them select the right play. And when the answer came back from both of them, the play was The Sisters. Of course, the manuscript of The Sisters did happen to be on top of the package of plays we'd sent them. And when you hear this play, I believe you'll understand what captured their imaginations so quickly. It was the same tense quality that made Myron Brinig's story a best-selling novel and later a hit Warner Brothers picture. Let's go back now to the time when this love story begins. As the curtain rises on Act One of The Sisters, starring Irene Dunn as Louise and David Niven as Frank. It's election night, 1904, and the prosperous mining town of Silver Bow, Montana, is alive with excitement. The big event of the year is at hand, the election ball. In a quiet section of town, the corner gas lamp shines on the familiar colored bottles in the window of Ned Elliott's drugstore. Tonight, the store is dark, but in the apartments upstairs, the Elliots and their three daughters are dressing for the great occasion. Dad, burn it! Whoever invented collar buttons anyway? Get in there, you Andre pig-headed. Oh, dear. There's the knife bell ringing in the store. Ned! Let it ring, Dad Burnett. This stiff collar is driving me crazy. Ned, the bell. Call out the window and tell them the store's closed for the night. Oh, pay no attention. They'll go away. Daddy, the knife bell's ringing. I'm dead. Ned, will you please go down and see who it is? Maybe somebody's sick. Ma, I'm stuck. Mother. Oh, dear, that's Helen again. I'll be right there, dear. Ned, answer the door. All right, all right. I'm going to... Mother. Coming, Helen. Now, what's all the trouble? Oh, Mother, my dress is all caught and Grace is mussing me up. Grace, you're pulling my hair. Well, how else can I get the hook loose if you'll only stand still a minute? Girl, stop calling. Now, be quiet, Helen. I'll get it out. Thanks. You're a darling, Mother. There. Now, you'd better hurry. I'm all ready, Mother. Thank goodness there's someone in this family I can depend on. 
Tom Nibble's calling for us in his automobile. He'll be here any minute now, and we mustn't keep him waiting. Doing good, the old stick in the mud. Helen, don't you dare call Tom names. He's no stick in the mud, and you know it. Someone would think the way you stick up for him, he wants to marry you instead of Louise. Girls, please. Well, she's got no right to talk like that. Tom Nibble's the banker's son, and she ought to be proud she's going to have him for a brother-in-law. That's very true, Grace. Helen, you're too impertinent. Go and see if Louise is ready. All right. Oh, Louise! Louise! What do you want? Louise's mother wants to know if... <gasps> oh, golly, you're beautiful, Louise. Mm -hmm. So are you. You'll be the belle of the ball, Helen. Uh-huh. And who knows but what I'll meet a dark, handsome man. And as we dance together, he'll say to me, Darling, I love you. And I'll say... Ah, Rudolph, you must forget me, for my parents will not allow me to marry a penniless artist. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't imagine you marrying a penniless artist. Why not? You like good things too well. Maybe I ought to marry Sam Johnson. Helen, he's got a daughter older than you are. Still, he's not at all bad looking, and he's got oodles of money. <gasps> oh, my, your flowers are pretty. Did Tom Nibble send them? Yes. When are you going to get married? Well, he hasn't asked me yet. Well, I wish he'd hurry up. Oh, not that I want you to leave, but the sooner you get married, the sooner one of us can have your room. I'm getting awfully sick of sleeping with Grace. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, but Tom won't be rushed. Louise, why do you want to marry that old stick in the mud anyhow? Tom is a nice young man. The girl who marries him will be a very lucky person. Hmm, maybe. Louise? I'm ready, Mother. coming. I can hear the automobile. Mother, Tom's coming. Please hurry. Grace, don't get so excited. Oh, come on, Mother. We can see him from the window. Come on, Louise. Land sakes. Doesn't seem possible that thing can run by itself. Move over. Let me see. Oh, Helen, stop pushing. Oh, look at it. Maybe it'll explode. Oh, did, did you think you'd be able to stop it? <laughs> Good work, Tom. Hello, folks. The chariot's raring to go. Had her up to 15 miles an hour coming down. For land sakes. Will you keep that thing down to a common sense speed, Tom Nibble, or I'm not going to ride in it. I'll come down and let you in, Tom. You don't mind, do you, Louise? Why, of course not. Hey, Tom, get a horse. Helen, stop being so fresh. Ned, Ned, aren't you ready yet? Get your coat on now or we'll all be late for the election ball. And see all this fuss about Teddy Roosevelt. Big windbag, that's all he is. Oh, you reactionaries haven't got any vision. He'll be elected tonight, now you wait. Yeah, I'll wait, but my money's on Parker. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just received some more returns. Alabama, 1,208 for Parker, uh, 29 for Roosevelt. <laughs> Connecticut... Connecticut, Parker, 11,009. Roosevelt, 56,901. That's all now. We'll give you some more as soon as we're here. Gee, Helen, you certainly are beautiful tonight. Thank you, Bill. Everybody's looking at you. You know what, Helen? You're the belle of the ball. Oh, how nice of you. Oh, look, there's Mr. Johnson. Well, what of it? Is he so important? Bill... Who's that man with him? The young fellow. I don't know. I never saw him before. He's handsome, isn't he? Yeah, I, I guess so. Say, Helen... Must be a stranger in town. Excuse me, will you, Bill? Hey, hey, hey wait a minute. Where are you going? Well, here you are, Medlin. The elite of Silver Bowl gathered to dance in a new president. How do you like them? Nice people, Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. The best in the world. Maybe I'd like them better if I had a drink. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Well, hello, Helen. Say, you sure are pretty tonight. Why, uh, did you save me a dance? Oh, I couldn't, Mr. Johnson. They're all gone. Why didn't you come sooner? Couldn't. Big prize fight tonight on over in Silsby. Well, if a prize fight is more important... Oh, excuse me for butting in like that, Mr. Oh, uh, sorry. This is Frank uh, Madeline, Helen Elliott. How do you do, Mr. Madeline? Good evening. He's a newspaper man from San Francisco, Helen, and uh, he likes prize fights better than dancers and a good drink better than pretty girls. <laughs> He's a dangerous man, so look out for him. Oh, how exciting. Are you here for any reason, Mr. Medlin? Do you always have a reason for what you do? <laughs> Got her there, Medlin. This young one doesn't know what the word reason means. Come on, Helen. How about stealing this dance? All right. Excuse us, Madeline. I'll fix up some dances for you, Mr. Medlin. No, thanks. I, I don't dance. Excuse me, mister. Can you tell me where the bar is? What's that? The bar. You're in that woman's club, mister. 
Oh, yes, the, the woman's club. Thanks. But if you really want a drink, mister, down those stairs on the other side of the dance floor, out that door, and just a turn to the left. Oh, thanks. You're a pal. I'll see you there in a few minutes. <laughs> Flowers, Tom. They're lovely. They are when you wear them, Louise. Uh, hey. Sorry. Hey, you. what's the idea? You're not supposed to walk across the dance floor. My apologies. My mind was on the shortest distance between two points. Well, too bad you haven't got wings. Oh, please, Tom. I'm sure he didn't realize what he was doing. I assure you it was an unintentional but delightful encounter. Well, next time, look where you're going. Come on, Tom. Let's dance. Hey, mister. Off the dance floor. <laughs> Listen. Who is that beautiful creature in blue just rounding the corner there? Her? Oh, uh, that's one of the Elliot girls. Elliot? Please, Elliot. Oh, not, not a sister of the little one dancing with Sam Johnson. Yeah, that's right. Oh, thanks very much. Gee, you sure dance elegantly, Louise. Oh, thank you, Tom. Louise, uh, maybe this isn't the right place, but, well, it kind of seems like the right time to ask you if... Uh, if what, Tom? Well, what I mean is I... I've been meaning to ask Hello, you... remember me? Say, so what do you mean? Excuse me, uh, Miss Elliot, your sister said I should introduce myself. Oh, did she? Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. Louise, we're in the middle of a dance. Now, that's just the point. Look, you're an honest, respectable citizen with a heart of gold. I'm just a lonely soul who'll soon be vanishing into eternal darkness. Give me one bright memory to carry me off with me, will you? Let me dance with this lovely lady. You will? I knew you would. Thanks very much. Hey, hey, hey listen, come back here. <laughs> Goodness. Do you always take the shortest distance between two points? Always, if the end is desirable enough. <laughs> so my sister said you should introduce yourself. Mm-hmm. Your sister is very beautiful, Miss Elliot. Yes, she is. You're more beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, I've seen plenty of beautiful women all over the world. The most beautiful women I know are the Turkish women. Their faces are covered, so I use my imagination. I'm afraid I don't understand. You don't right now because you're a little bewildered. But ordinarily, you understand everything. Let's find a place where I can explain what I mean. Well, I really don't think I should. Then don't think. Look, I could get us some supper, and we could have it outside somewhere, out of this jam. Oh, no, I'm afraid. No, no please. I, I'm a harmless person, honest. Uh, yes, I think you are. <laughs> if I just make it to that table, we'll have supper. Oh, you shouldn't have brought so much. Yeah, made it. Terrain, votai, trufea, ashara, votai, gratina, noi, earth, la pompadour, champagne, gordon rouge, 1897 for mademoiselle. Oh, it sounds very impressive and mysterious. <laughs> In other words, hard boiled eggs and drinks. Mademoiselle, I offer a toast to Silver Bow for harboring unsuspected beauty. Oh. <coughs> What's that? Oh, fruit punch. Oh, it's awful stuff. You'd like it better if it were actually champagne, wouldn't you? I'd like it best if it were straight bourbon. We haven't either, so uh, let's go back to imagination and, and Turkish women. You know, I imagined a face like yours behind every veil. Oh, what an unusually clever compliment. Oh, I'm not clever. I'm really very stupid. I have no ambition. I never know what I want. I'm simply an incurable newspaper tramp who's never been known to stay in one place as soon as he had enough money to go someplace else. Well, what are you looking for? Mm, something I haven't seen yet. There's always something new beyond the horizon. Would you like to hear the story of my life? No, no, I think no, I... It's, it's a very exciting, though completely pointless story. It might serve as a warning to you. Why should you warn me? <laughs> That's a good question. Do you suppose I'm uh, developing a sense of responsibility? You're probably too lazy for that. You should try watching the bees sometime. Oh, couldn't stand it. Little animals busily doing the same thing over and over. No, no, not me. I'm either a free soul or a tramp dog, however you look at it. That's all I want to be. I'll give you a paradox, Miss Elliot. You have a very exciting serenity. <laughs> I have silver bowl. And you have places to go and things to see. May I take you home later? Well, I... I... Oh, listen. More returns. I think we'd better go in. More returns. With half the country still to be heard from, it can safely be said that the President of the United States for the next four years will be... Theodore Roosevelt! Roosevelt's showing us the way in government, and this fellow Theodore Dreiser is doing it in literature. America's growing up. My book is going to tell about the growing pains. Oh, it sounds terribly exciting. How far have you gotten? Oh, you can't just plunge into a book like that. You had to think about it a long time. 
Oh, I see. Well, here's where I live. Thank you for bringing me home, Mr... Why, I don't even know your name. Medlin. Frank Medlin. Oh. Good night, Mr. Medlin. Good night, Miss Elliot. You've done a very terrible thing to me, Miss Elliot. I was quite comfortable with my unwritten novel. It gave me a, a sense of importance to think of it when I had nothing else to do. Well, didn't you intend to write it? Oh, of course, when I had the time and the money. Perhaps if I had someone to talk with about it. Well, I'll talk with you, if that would help. Well, I was going back to San Francisco tomorrow. Got a new job waiting for me. Oh, well... Uh, I'll wire and say I'll be a week late. Tomorrow night? Yes. Come to dinner with my family. Oh, no, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> scared to death. But spend every evening with me, and I'll come to dinner the day I leave. Will you start your book? Absolutely. Then it's agreed. Good night. Good night. Louise? Louise? Is that you, Helen? We saw him bring you home, Louise. Come in, come in. Well, what happened, Louise? Was it awfully exciting? Do you love him very Helen, much? what ideas you have. I only met him tonight. Oh, what difference does that make? Grace, isn't it wonderful? Louise is in love. You should be ashamed of yourself, Helen. I can see it in her eyes, can't you? I wish I could fall in love. How does it feel? Is it all in your heart? Oh, you're so silly, Helen. You do act very strange, Louise. <laughs> it's love, I tell you. Perhaps it is. I don't know. I know that he's irresponsible and restless. I know that he hasn't the kind of ambition we've been taught to expect in a man. But he makes me feel alive. As if I were born for something else besides marrying Tom Neville and, and gradually dying in Silver Bow. I know just how you feel. Well, I don't. I don't understand it at all. I can't think of anything nicer than, well, than living in Silver Bow. Louise, I'll scratch that man's eyes out if he makes you do anything foolish. Why, Grace? <laughs> you darling. When are you going to see him again, Louise? Tomorrow night and every night for a week. And on his last evening in Silver Bow... He's coming to dinner. Have some more roast beef, Mr. Medlin? Uh, thanks. Uh, I, um, I understand you're from San Francisco, Mr. Medlin. Oh, uh, oh. I'm leaving tonight on the 12.55. A mother asked if you were from San Francisco. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. I shouldn't think a man would want to earn a living writing about prize fights, Mr. Medlin. They're so cruel. Well, it's just my job. Someday I want to go to San Francisco to dance, Mr. Medlin. I've been taking lessons, you know, from Madame Elise Murphy. First it was New York, now it's San Francisco. Well, I've decided on San Francisco because Louise will be living there. Helen! And I... Helen! And what makes you think Louise is going to live there? Is there anything your father and I should know about Louise? I know. I, I can't imagine why Helen should have said that. I think Miss Helen meant she would come and stay with Louise and myself when we're married. What? All the nonsense. Why, Frank, you haven't even proposed to me yet. Will you marry me, Louise? Why, this is ridiculous. I never Say heard. yes, Louise. Say yes. Shame on you, it's Helen. It's perfectly absurd, Mr. Medlin. Louise is going to marry a fine, upstanding young man. Yes, the banker's son. A splendid match. No man in his right senses would ask her to... Why, it's absolutely ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous. No man should be willing to give up his freedom for a woman. It's even absurd. But I'm in love. Don't you say anything about marriage, young man. Ned, we're talking about Louise. Yes, of course. Young man, you Yes, can. you can. Helen, be quiet. My daughter is going to marry a respectable businessman. Rose, it's about time. Someone told Father, Grace to talk to you. Father, please, Father, you please, realize... Father. Please don't go. Oh, I'm sorry, Louise, but I've got to. <laughs> it was all very beautiful and very hopeless. And I do love you. I'll always love you. Frank, I can't have you running off like this. Oh, it's hopeless, Louise. I have no right to love you. It's not fair. But I love you, Frank. Oh, you say it very simply, without emotion, without heroics, as if it were an irrefutable fact. Yes. It is. Then come to San Francisco with me tonight. Oh, darling, I'll arrange I for a license minister, everything. We could be married by the time the train pulls out. Tell your family. Oh, no. No, I'd rather not tell them. I think I'll... I'll need all the courage I have to marry you. Yes. I guess you will.
curtain falls on Act One of The Sisters, with two brave young people facing a great adventure. We'll hear more of this adventure in Act Two, but during the brief intermission, our Mr. Ruick and his versatile trio have a pleasant novelty for you. Irene Dunn and David Niven will be back for Act Two after our intermission, and that gives me just time enough to take up a little matter with our trio. It's about a song they promised to have ready to sing to you tonight. And here we are, Mr. Ruick. All ready to keep the promise. That's wonderful. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I was talking to our trio the other day about Lux Toilet Soap's distinctive sampler wrapper, how easy it was to recognize it anywhere. The girls agreed that I was right, but added that there were more important things about Lux Soap that one would always recognize. And they said they'd explain in the song tonight just what they meant. Are you ready to explain, girls? Lux Toilet Soap is a soap that we hope you will know anytime, anywhere. But we're emphasizing what you'll recognize in this marvelously mild beauty care. If it's soothing, if it's smooth, that's Lux Toilet Soap. If it's quite the purest white, that's Lux Toilet Soap. If it lathers luxuriously, if it cleanses your skin thoroughly, perfumed exclusively, then quite conclusively, that's Lux Toilet Soap. Thanks very much, girls. But you've left me one thing to explain. Why it is that Lux Toilet Soap cleanses your skin so thoroughly. This is the reason. Lux Toilet Soap has active lather, quick, rich lather that takes away swiftly, completely, every bit of dust and dirt and stale cosmetics. No hidden traces remain. Lux Toilet Soap really helps you keep your complexion soft and smooth. It doesn't matter how much you use cosmetics. What does matter is that you give your skin the protection of perfect cleansing, the protection you get with active lather. So please, don't take any chances. Make gentle, white Lux Toilet Soap your regular complexion care. Use it before you renew makeup, always when you go to bed. Here's our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Sisters, starring Irene Dunn as Louise and David Niven as Frank. Six months have passed since Louise left Silver Bow on a midnight train as Mrs. Frank Medlin. They've been happy months, with Louise and Frank wrapped up in their love for each other, dreaming of the day when his great book will be finished. In their three-room apartment in San Francisco, Louise occupies herself with the business of homemaking. On this evening, she's preparing dinner and waiting for the sound of Frank's step in the hall. Say, Derry, I hate to bother you, but I wonder if you could spare me a little butter. I've been called to Oakland to see my mother. She took sick, and I was just going to have a bite before I go when I see there ain't a speck of butter in the ice Why, box. yes, of course. Come in, won't you? Thanks, Derry. Uh, I'm Flora Gibbon. I've been meaning to come over and introduce myself, being as I live just across the hall, but I've been so busy seeing my mother and all. Yes, a sick mother's always a responsibility. There, will that be enough butter? Oh, plenty, thanks. My, your dinner smells good. Your husband must be coming home, huh? Yes, yes, any minute now. Well, I gotta be going. Uh, being your neighbor, I can't help but notice your husband works nights a lot. Yes, he's a newspaper man. He has to cover a story whenever it breaks. Oh, now, ain't that exciting? A newspaper man right across the hall. Oh, I guess that's him coming now. Well, uh, thanks for the butter and don't take any wooden nickels. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Medlin? Hello. How are you, darling? Hello, Frank. Dinner almost ready? Yes, darling, almost. Oh, good. I'm starving. Anything exciting happened today? Yes, got a letter from Helen. Seems that Grace has done such a good job of curing Tom Neville's broken heart that the family are now waiting breathlessly for him to propose. Yeah? Well, at least she won't have to live on $25 a week. Well, we're managing. I'm happy. Oh, come here. I'm jealous of anyone who has more than you. I have you. I only want you. If that's all I get, it's enough. <laughs> You're not from Silver Bow, Louise. 
You're from the earth. The good, rich earth that brings its own beauty with it. I married you from my heart, not my head. Oh, dear, something's boiling over. Close the window, will you, Frank? It's freezing. Oh, I can't. The place still reeks of that woman across the hall. Oh, now, don't say that. She may be cheap and loud, but at least it's nice to have someone stop in once in a while. Do you realize she's the first person I've met in all the months we've been in San Francisco? Oh, I never thought of that. You'll have to get out more. How about tonight? No, no, you're working on your book tonight. Oh, but I've worked on it every free night I've had. I know, and you're going to keep right on. It would be worth a little loneliness to have people point me out as the wife of the famous author, Frank Medlin. Oh, man can't keep his nose to the grindstone all the time. (laughs) Frank, you know, you look just like a baby when you part. (laughs) Oh, you're a slave driver, Mrs. Medlin. I adore you, but you're a slave driver. Dear Dad, it's raining and it's warm and snug in my apartment. And when Frank comes home, it will be cozy too. He's late tonight, and I know he'll be sorry because along with all the grand news from you about Grace's marriage, I've news of my own. Ah, yes. Frank, what's happened? You're all wet and dirty. Why, you're... Oh, Frank. It's disgraceful. Give me your coat, it's soaked. Started to go to sleep in a nice, comfortable gutter where there's no rent to pay, no novels to write, nothing. And I remembered I was a man of responsibilities, so I came home. <laughs> man of responsibilities, that's me. Well, what's the matter? What are you looking at me like that for? Wet feet. <laughs> Get the floor wet. Take him off. Come on, come on, sit up. I'll do it. No, I won't allow my wife to take any man's shoes off. Degrading is what it Please, is. Please, Frank. Darling husband is degrading. <clears throat> kind of husband makes everyone feel sorry oh, for his please, wife. Please, please. I know, I know. Don't say it. Sometimes a man goes from wanting nothing to wanting too much. He should do it gradually or he gets all mixed up. I'm going to bed. Don't touch me. I don't need any help. I know he'll be sorry, because with all the grand news from you about Grace's marriage, I've news of my own. I'm going to have a baby. Come on, Louise. We can get through the crowd over this way. Oh, dear. We're late? No, just the preliminaries on now. Sure you don't want to change your mind, honey? No, I've always wanted to see a prize fight. <laughs> Liar. But I love you, darling. Even if you won't trust me out of your sight. Come on, let's go in. Come on. Here comes the fifth round. How long does this go on? Oh, till they get a knockout or it could go the limit for a decision. Why? Oh, nothing. It's terribly exciting, isn't it? Exciting? I bet you a quarter you'll be sorry you came. It's the best. <laughs> You're a good sport, darling. Hiya, Frank. Hello, Tim. Louise, this is Tim Hazeltine, old friend of mine and the best sports writer in the country. Tim, my wife. How do you do? Frank's told me a lot about you, Mr. Hazeltine. Yeah? You shouldn't be here, Mrs. Medlin. Prize fighting isn't for ladies. Oh, I think it's very interesting. <laughs> I couldn't do a thing with it, Tim. Hey, that southern boy's got a nice left. Yeah, Rose can take it. He'll be in there when the Memphis kid has worn himself out throwing punches. Have a drink? Thanks. Oh, Frank. Oh, oh I'm sorry, darling. I forgot. Thanks, Tim, but uh, I've been off the stuff for a month. Yeah? Let him have it, Rose! Look at him bleed! He's bloody! Oh, he's bleeding! Hey, darling, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Oh, don't mind me. But you're as white as a ghost. Come on, we're getting no, out. No, no, it's all right, Frank. I, I just feel a little sick. Here, darling, drink some water. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Oh, don't be. <laughs> I'm proud of you for getting sick. Now, I'm going to take you home. Oh, no, Frank. No, you get back in there and take care of your job. I'll get home alone. I said I was going to now, take... Now, please. I want you to write the best fight story you've ever written in your life. Something people will talk about. We can't take any chances now. Well, what's all the emergency about? Frank, 
I'm going to have a baby. Louise, darling. No, don't darling me. Be a good reporter. Write a good story. It's, it's a miracle. I, I'm going to be a father. Thanks, me. Look, I don't feel very well. I want to go home. But I won't go until I know you're in there covering that fight. All right, I'll go. And, and, and don't worry, darling. Everything's going to be fine. So long, Mother. Oh, goodbye, <laughs> darling. I'll see you. Oh, oh. Hey, hey, what's the matter with her? She fainted. Get a doctor, somebody. Get a doctor. What do you think, doctor? How is she? Perhaps too much strain, Mr. Medler, both physical and mental. Too many emotional upsets. There are many contributing factors, but... Will she be all right, Doctor? Certainly. And the baby? Not this time. Suppose you go in and talk to her. Louise. Who won the fight, dear? Oh, I shouldn't have. You should have told me. I owe you a quarter, Frank. I bet I wouldn't be sorry I went to the fight. Oh, darling, it was all my fault. No, no. It's no one's fault, dear. People can't love each other as much as we do without paying for it somehow. That's all. Oh, you're crying, darling. I know it's silly, isn't it? Because there's nothing to cry about. There's too much that is to give tears to what might have been. Hello, honey. Why, Frank, what are you doing home so early? It's only four o'clock. Well, I got my story out and thought I'd take it easy for a change. Oh, what's this, letter from home? Yes, what do you think? Helen's going to marry Sam Johnson. He's taking her to Europe, and then they're going to live in New York when they get back. Well, that's fine. Now, both your sisters are sitting pretty. A banker and a millionaire, that's great. What's wrong, darling? Nothing, except the old man gave me an unexpected Christmas present, that's all. Yes? He fired me. Why? Because I asked him for a raise. There was something else. You fought. Say, where does he come off telling me I drink too much? He kills a quarter whiskey a day himself right there in the office. I see. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I, I lost my temper and acted like a fool. Don't worry, I, I'll get another job. Plenty of jobs for good sports yes, writers. of course, of course. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to take a job myself, Frank. A job? What kind of a job? In a department store, a secretary. I'd rather you forgot it. Well, I'm sorry, Frank. I can't forget it. If I can help, I'm going to. If we can't be partners in everything, what sense is that a marriage? Well, I'll not have my wife slaving away in a department store all day. Well, I'd rather do that than worry about unpaid bills, money for rent, food. That's right. Throw it up to me. I can't make enough to support my no, wife properly. No, it isn't that, Frank. No, if it, if it hadn't been for the baby... Oh, I we... suppose that was my fault, too. Oh, Frank. All right, we'll go to work if you want to, but I won't hang around. I can tell you that. Everything will be different between us. Now, make up your mind. Are you going to take that job? I've got to. I can't live anymore in a house full of bills. All right. Where are you going? I'm going out. Do you mind, or would you like to keep me on a leash? Oh, Frank. Merry Christmas. <laughs> darling, darling, wake up. Oh, huh? I'm leaving now. You'll find coffee on the stove and some toast in the oven. Just turn on the gas. That's wonderful, isn't it? Wife works. Husband has nothing to do but turn on the gas. Frank, please. Oh, sorry. Will you be home for dinner tonight? I don't know. We're still taking inventory at the store. Which means you'll probably have dinner with Mr. Benson. And Mr. Benson is very considerate when he keeps me late. I'd be, too, if I had a secretary as beautiful as you. I happen to be your wife, Frank. Oh, I'm sorry. Darling, I love you. I love your face... The way you walk, talk, think. Everything about you and it's killing me. I'm a no good tramp, Louise. I had a job and I fell down on it. I can't write. You can write. You must. Oh, there's a kind of quiet assurance about you that bewilders me. I've never been sure of anything. Except that the next job was more exciting than the one I happened to have. Well, you warned me, dear. Yes, I thought I was very clever. If worst comes to worst, I said to myself, she can't say I didn't warn her. Well, then forget you warned me. Pretend you've made a bargain you've got to live up to. Oh, I wish I could, but I can't. Frank, I'm going to quit my job. From now on, I'm going to depend on you. If you starve, I starve. If you die, I die. That's a great sacrifice to make for a man. No, who's... I'm being completely selfish. I love you. 
I want to keep you. But I want you to be the strong one, not I. Oh, and you can be, dear. I know it's in you. Look, it's your fight now if you love me. If I love you. If I love you. Another one, Mr. Madeline? Yeah, fill her up, Pete. Hello, Frank. Oh, it's you, Tim. Hello. I heard you were making the rounds today for a job. News travels fast. Did you also hear no one would give me one? What are you waiting for, Frank? A miracle? You know you're washed up in San Francisco? Do you know why? I'll pay for my drinks for you, Tim. So long. Wait a minute. What's next, Frank? I don't know. Oh, I've got a lot of thinking to do. I want to find out why... I've become a walking corpse. Why, marriage made my wife strong and me weak. Oh, a lot of things. You know, maybe what's wrong with you, Frank, is that as much as you want love, you want freedom more. That's a very tragic love story, Tim. So long. Okay, if that's the way you feel about it. I, uh, I'll be around if you need me. See them all, lad, up and down the coast of Africa from Tangier to Somaliland, from the streets to Yokohama. Set them up, Nate. Right. Right it is. Uh, you ain't seen nothing till you followed the Mediterranean from Tetuan along the North African coast, making port to Tripoli. And then through the Suez Canal down the Red Sea to Djibouti. Hot, stinking holes, every one of them. Yeah. Me for the North Atlantic. Hey, you fellas, you happen to know of any ships sailing tonight? Huh? Well, the Parana sails tonight. She's a tramp freighter heading for Singapore first. No telling where next. Uh, she's a rusty tub mate, and the skipper's a man killer. If I was you, thanks, I'd... thanks very much. Look at him huh. beat it. That guy must be awful anxious. Just mark it down ten percent, Miss Artell. Mister Benson's orders. Very well, Missus Medlin. Hello, darling. May I come in? Well, Frank. That's all, Miss Artell. Well, you finally came up to see my office. <laughs> it never seemed quite um, opportune before, but. I had a funny feeling I couldn't last the day unless I saw you. Well, that's all. So long. Oh, well, aren't you going to kiss me? Well, someone might do. Oh, darling, who cares? Oh. Uh, oh, excuse me. Oh, Mr. Benson, this is my husband, Mr. Medlin. I gathered as much. How do you do, Mr. Medlin? Hello. Your wife tells me she's resigning at the end of the month, Mr. Medlin. Is she? It's going to be a terrible loss to me. Yes, yes, I imagine so. Louise, are you going to work this evening? Well, we haven't quite finished. Oh, but if there's something important... No, 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 there's nothing. I, I was just wondering, because I'm going to start working tonight. The best job I ever had. Well, Frank, how wonderful. On what paper? Well, you know all about it when you get home. Benson, um, are you taking my wife to dinner tonight? Well, not if you have any objections. No, no, it's quite all right. I just want to ask you to take her to an especially fancy gin. Get her some champagne. Be very gay. Why, Frank, I... It's all right, darling. It'll be kind of a farewell dinner, you know. Well, goodbye. You'll be home early. Remember, Benson, champagne. Oh, it's you, Flora. Oh, dearie, I... I seen you come home. Yes, I just got in. I, I'm awful nervous tonight. I, I ain't never had such a peculiar feeling before, like... like something was gonna happen. Well, that's strange. I feel that way, too. <laughs> What do you suppose it is? Oh, it's something in the air. Too quiet. I got to feeling like I didn't want to be alone. Why, well, what's the matter, dearie? It's a note. Frank must have left it for me. Oh, had to work late, huh? Gee, reporters ain't got no easy time, I guess. I used no. to think... Oh, no, Frank. Why, what is it, dearie? What's the matter? Oh, Flora, how can I find out what ships are sailing tonight? Why, I don't know. Maybe if you... Please... Stay here, will you, Flora? If my husband comes back, tell him I went out to look for him. Tell him I'll be right back. Hmm. Dear Louise, I figured it all out and made my decision. Love in a flat dies a tawdry death. It dies more beautifully beyond the horizon. And so at midnight I sail as a common seaman for... The horizon. Huh. 
Uh, who's there? It's all right, Flora. Oh, oh, it's you, dearie. I must have dozed off for a minute. Gee, you look all in. Did you find him? No. I finally heard about a freighter, but I got there too late. Oh, gee, that's tough. Where you been all night? Walking. All this time? Why, why, it's after five. Gosh, I've been worried about you. I've been going crazy here all by myself. I swear I never felt so jumpy in all my life. He'll come back. He isn't strong, you know. He's not on a ship. He's drunk in some bar room. He'll come back. All I have to do is wait. Sure. You try and get some rest. Good Lord, what happened? I don't know. Are you all right? Oh, yes. What's the end of the world? The end of the world. An earthquake. we got to get out of here. The whole wall fell out. Oh, no, I've got to wait for friends. Oh, there ain't no time. Come on. Well, I'll wait as long as I can. But you'll be killed. I tell you, get out of here. I know. I've got to stay. Come on. The city's in flames. What's the matter, Captain? What's the excitement? Big earthquake in fire in Frisco. In Frisco? Captain, I've got to get back there. You're heading for Singapore meddling. Get back on your watch. But my wife's there. Don't you understand? She needs me now. Please, I've got to get to her. He said get out. I'm going back if I have to swim. Get that guy. Put him away. Let go of me. I've got to get to her. must be crazy to think he comes from ashore. Louise! That was Act Two of The Sisters. Our love story reaches a dramatic climax in Act Three, which we hear in a moment. But in the intermission, while we're waiting for the return of Irene Dunn and David Niven in our play, a colleague of ours, whom you all know, has something pertinent to say about the relative value of minutes. Did you ever know a woman who was so eager to gain time for sleep that she stole it like this? Gosh, am I tired tonight? I'm going straight to bed. No time out for even washing my face. I'm one minute. I'm another. This makes three of us. All it would have taken to give her skin the protection of Lux toilet soap care. Yes, three little minutes. That's all it takes every night to give your skin gentle, active lather care with Lux toilet soap. Just three little minutes for care that's really important to your good looks. What could be more foolish than to neglect this care? Run the risk of spoiling the soft, smooth beauty of your skin. The gentle, active lather of Lux soap does a thorough cleansing job. It removes every trace of stale cosmetics, dust, and dirt that might remain to choke the pores. You know, choked pores are the cause of unattractive cosmetic skin. Those little blemishes that are so annoying the enlarged pores that spoil the texture of your skin. You can use cosmetics all you wish. Lux Soap's Active Lather gives you the protection of perfect cleansing. Protects your skin. It's mild and gentle. Good for your complexion. That's why nine out of ten screen stars use it. Your skin needs the protection that thorough active lather cleansing can give. Needs it regularly, every day. So use Lux Soap every night before you go to bed. Make the few minutes you spend on bedtime beauty care for your complexion count. Start your Lux Soap beauty care tonight, won't you? We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue with Act Three of The Sisters. It 
It's been two years since that tragic April night when San Francisco lay in ruins and Louise's life seemed as shattered as the city. In all this time, there's been no word from Frank. But as the new San Francisco rises about her, Louise has found a secondary happiness in her work. And now she's an important figure in the Benson store. Mrs. Medlin, may I have the approved sale prices? Mm, here they are. Thank you. I checked on that train, Mrs. Medlin. It leaves at 2.45. <laughs> yes, I know. Oh, will you take a telegram, please? Yes, ma'am. To Mrs. Thomas Neville, Silver Bowl, Montana. Leaving 2.45. Be with you tomorrow. Delighted to hear Helen coming, too. May I be godmother. Love, Louise. I'll get it off right away, Mrs. Medlin. Thanks. I'll say goodbye to Mr. Benson. Come in. I just wanted to say goodbye. Oh, so I'm going to lose you, Louise. Oh, it's only for a week or two, William. Ah, it's too long. How will the store run without you? <laughs> Very well, I'm sure. Helen's going to be there, too. I just got word. All reserves to the front. Ah, eh? uh, you Elliots are a clannish bunch. <laughs> Always have been. Oh, I think it's great. But you know, it, it makes an outsider feel lonesome. I suppose Tom wants a boy. I suppose so. But I guess Grace won't care which it is just so long as... as it arrives safely. Yes, I guess that's right. Louise, you... You you won't be staying more than a week, will you? No, why? Because when you come back, I want to have a talk with you. I want to ask you a very serious question. What is it, William? When you get back. <laughs> very well. Goodbye, William. Goodbye, Louise. Isn't he a doll, Louise? There's a fine young man for you. Thomas Neville, Jr. May I, may I hold him, nurse, for just a minute? Certainly, Mrs. Medlin. Thomas Neville, Jr. Are you sorry, Louise? No, I'm not sorry. Fair, fair little fellow. It's a wonderful world you're in. There's nothing to cry about. Well, Grace got what she wanted. Did you, Helen? Oh, Sam is very kind. We can't have everything, can we? No, we make our choice. You may go into Mrs. Nimble now. She's waiting for you. Come along, young man. Bedtime. Come on, Louise. Well, how's the proud mother? Just fine. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Grace. So am I, darling. You were sweet to come, both of you. We three after all this time. It's good, isn't it? It's wonderful. The only thing to spoil the picture is that you won't be well enough for the election ball Tuesday. I know, it's too bad. But what do I care about elections when I've just got a president of my own? Oh, Frank! Frank Medlin! Oh, hello, Tim. Nice of you to come down. I got your letter. Where have you been? Everywhere. Nowhere. Why, Frank, you look like somebody forgot to bury you. Sick? I've got a lot of tongue-twisting things the matter with me. I should be dead, only I... I couldn't go without seeing Louise again. Kind of late, aren't you, Frank? What do you mean? I mean, she's better off without you. She's got a good job. Benson is ready to marry her any time she says yes. Is she in love with him? Oh, I don't know, but I do know this. Give her a little more time and she'll get over you. I, I don't want her to get over me. I love her. Want to come along with me now? Why, where are you going? To Benson's. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll get a cab. Nellan's gone away until after election. Where's she gone? Miss Ortel, will you get those? Oh. Hello, Mr. Medlin. Hello, Benson. How are you, Tim? Pretty well. Come into my office, will you? Well, Medlin, when did you get back? Today. Where's my wife? In Silver Bow. Thanks. Wait a minute. You're not going to Silver Bow? Get out of my way, Tim. You're going to stay away from her if I have to Tim. take... Don't. You can't keep him from going to her. Don't you understand he's got the go for Louise's sake as well as his own? There mustn't be any more uncertainty, Tim, any more waiting. If they belong together, let them be together. If they don't, well, let them know it. We'll know very soon. Miss Hortel, come here, please. Yes, sir? Call my house and tell them to pack a bag. I'm leaving tonight for Silver Bow. Burned 
Henry. Pig-headed. Why does a man have to wear a collar anyway? Ned, the night bell's ringing. Well, let it ring. It might be important. Danny, the night bell's ringing. I'm dead. Ned, will you please answer it? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Dad, burn it. Every time we're going someplace. Well, what is it? Is Mrs. Louise Medlin in? I'm William Benson. Mr. Benson? Sure, she's in. Hey, Louise, Mr. Benson is here. What? Mr. Benson from San Francisco. Well, wait a minute. Did you say... What, William? Hello, Louise. William, how exciting. What are you doing in Silver Bowl? I'll tell you all about it later. Helen, Ned, Louise, will you please hurry and get ready? We'll be late for the election. I tell you, it's Brian Landslide. Who is this fellow Taft, anyway? Who is he? <laughs> You'll find out who he is when the returns start coming in. All right, all right, but I'm betting my money on Mr. Brian. Four years ago, Tim, it was just the same then. Time has turned to somersault. Yeah? There she is. Tim, she's more beautiful than ever. That's Benson with her, Frank. Benson? Take it easy. Tim. Bring her out here, will you? Huh? Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Funny, I, I'm afraid all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, I know. Maybe, um, Tim, maybe you should talk with her first, kind of prepare. Well, sure, sure. I'll, uh, I'll be right back. Now you can tell me, William, why you came. You'll know soon, Louise. And if I was wrong, I leave as quickly as I came. What is it, William? Something wrong? No. But there is. Oh, Louise. Tim, how did you get here? Could I uh, see you for a few minutes, please? Well, Go do ahead, you... Louise. I'll wait. Come on outside, Louise. Why out here, Tim? Because I wanted to talk to you about Frank. You first met here, didn't you? Yes. Yes. It's the first time we ever talked together. We talked about Turkish women and newspaper tramps. It was so young and silly. It was only four years ago. Four centuries ago, Tim. But you still love him. I'll always love him. And what would you do if he came back? I'd work for him or I'd starve with him. You see, Tim, if Frank hadn't tried to live my kind of life, he might have written that novel eventually. He might have become someone. He might have found what he was really looking for. If it hadn't been for me, he might have gone on looking for something new and being happy even if he couldn't find it. That's not true. Frank! Darling, I've got to say things that I've been thinking for two years. We must stop blaming ourselves for what happened. We can't help what we are, but time changes people. Time and the things one learns. And, and I had to leave you to learn there was nothing else to look for. And that what I thought I wanted was nothing oh, compared Frank. to what I oh, had. Frank, darling. Now, let me finish. I've come back now, and I won't go away again until our book is finished. Now, think hard, darling. Think it over carefully. What's left is ours, if you still want it that way. Frank, the 12.55 still leaves at 12.55. Oh, darling. And gentlemen, the latest returns to come in give Taft a substantial lead. It looks very much like William Howard Taft will be our next president. Why, here comes Louise now, Mr. Benson. Doesn't she look strange? Yes. Well, I... I think I'd better leave. But, Mr. Benson, what... Louise? Louise? Oh, Helen... Helen, I, I want to see William. But he's gone. He's just left. Gone. Then he knows. Louise, you look so strange. Like, like you're in love. Mm -hmm. It's the same love, Helen. And it's come back to me.
We leave the people of our play to the happiness they've found at last. While our stars, Irene Dunn and David Niven, are returning for a curtain call. And it's been too long, I might add, since either of them has taken a curtain call here. Well, I hope it won't be so long again. Hmm. It won't be if I have anything to do with it. You know, I'm puzzled why no one has ever teamed you two on the screen. Well, who knows? Perhaps you've started something. Anyway, it's a very nice compliment, C.B. Isn't it? You know, whenever I try to be diplomatic, I always put my foot in it. One time, I was visiting a friend of mine in Washington, and he took me to a party. A diplomatic affair, or did you have a good time? Uh, this was a diplomatic affair. <laughs> I was uh, warned to be careful, because a lot of important people were there. Well, I was introduced to a girl, and we were dancing. There didn't seem much to talk about. I just met her, so um, to be on the safe side, I pointed to a man at the window and said, that's a peculiar-looking bird. She said, that's my brother. But I was much smarter than that. I said, oh, no, no, not that one. I mean, the rather stupid-looking one sitting down. She said, that's my father, and I'm glad my grandfather isn't here. <laughs> just then, we danced into rather an elderly couple, and the girl said... And the girl said, may I present my grandfather? <laughs> well, you weren't there, were you? No. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. How do you suppose she knew that, Mr. DeMille? Mm, that's a phenomenon. That's always baffled science, David. Woman's intuition. They even play golf by it. Uh, tell me, Irene, how is your golf? Oh, I gave it up. <laughs> Never heard of a golfer who gave it up. My mere masculine intuition tells me we're in for a jolt. Why did you give it up, Irene? Oh, the whole thing's too easy. I got disgusted after I made the second hole in one, so I took up swimming. Mm. <laughs> Just like a woman to take a hole in one for granted. Oh, women always take the best of things for granted. Lux soap, for instance. Most women take it as a matter of course because it's such a dependable help to a good complexion. I've used it for years, but I only remember how good it is when I don't have any. By the way, C.B., what do you have scheduled for the Lux Theater next week? Next Monday night, we're going to have Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., Francis D., and Sir Cedric Hardwick in If I Were King. It's a rousing romantic drama of the vagabond poet who suddenly found himself king of France. The poet was Francois Villon, and he found that the king business wasn't everything he'd expected it to be. An excellent choice on your part, C.B. I know everyone will like it. Good night. So long, Mr. DeMille. Mm, good night. And if I were king, I'd command a return performance from both of you very soon. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., Francis D., and Sir Cedric Hardwick in If I Were King. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is Melville Roick, asking you to be sure to listen to the Lux Daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Searson. This human and gripping story of a young, attractive woman doctor is brought to you every afternoon, Monday through Friday. For the time and station, see your newspaper. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Heard in tonight's play were Gavin Gordon as Mr. Benson, Florence Baker as Grace, Kathleen Fitz as Helen, Forrest Taylor as Ned, Verna Felton as Rose Elliott, Ted Bliss as Tom Nibble, Stanley Farrar as Sam Johnson, Celeste Rush as Flora, Lou Merrill as Tim, Griff Barnett as doctor, Chester Clute as bartender, Frank Nelson as election announcer, James Eagles as Bill, Jean Vanderpile as Miss Ortel, and Ethel Sykes as nurse. Irene Dunn is currently appearing in the Universal Picture When Tomorrow Comes. David Diven has just completed a starring role in the Samuel Golden production, Raffles, soon to be released, and is now appearing in RKO's Bachelor Mother. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for the picture Hollywood Cavalcade. Our play, The Sisters, was adapted from the Warner Brothers picture of the same name. Warner's forthcoming production is The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, which will shortly be released. This picture is the thrilling story of Queen Elizabeth of England and the man she loved. <laughs> This 
is the Columbia Broadcasting System. To whoever this may impact, sometimes our lives have to be completely shaken up, changed, and rearranged to relocate is where we're really meant to be. Sometimes change feels like loss, transformation is scary, and sometimes to discover the best version of ourselves, we must let go of absolutely everything holding us down. Welcome to I Missed Me, your new safe space. I Missed Me's purpose is to help people all around the world to come back home to themselves. It is a healing self-growth podcast that encourages people to dive deep into their emotions, heal their traumas, and ultimately love themselves. My name is Mafia Sures, I am your host, and I hope to be a part of your healing journey.